the core idea and that some others are like leaning into now is like, yeah, if I'm holding ETH on a roll up, I should just be holding the liquid staking token. Like, like why wouldn't I? Um, and so I think that trend is going to very much play out in Celestia in a way that we just don't see um, in these other Cosmos chains of this one asset, like proliferating as money across these many different chains. Like once you're in that scenario, you're going to want the liquid staking token and you're going to want the one that's the most neutral, the safest, the most reliable, the closest to the base layer. Um, and that's what led us to strive because like they were clearly the best team who were doing this. We were very impressed. What's up, everyone? We are now almost one month out from DAS London, the largest institutional conference in all of crypto. That's happening March 18th through the 20th, obviously in London. This one's going to be a blast. We are almost 10 times oversubscribed for tickets, which is pretty nuts. So again, we've had to lower the discount to Bell 10 and better yet, make sure you bring your friends. We sell a four pack of tickets. Find people in your company, bring your boss, bring your family, bring your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, just go. You're gonna get a discount if you use that team pack. Run, don't walk. Make sure you go get those tickets today and cheers and see you in sunny London town. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Today, I'm joined by Aiden Salzman of Stride and John Charbonneau of DBA. Guys, welcome. How's it going? Good to be on. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, guys, this is going to be a blast. This was um, coming off the week of a, a massive, uh, or coming off the back of a massive week for Stride. Uh, by the time this is live, we're going to have uh, Stia alive, and John, I think, is going to take the cake for the most thorough uh, piece of content ever produced about a single protocol. And uh, for those of you who haven't uh, read this piece, this uh, little masterpiece, we're going to link it in the show notes, but I highly recommend that you read it because that was kind of the inspiration for a lot of what we're going to discuss today. So overall, guys, um, this is going to be a really fun uh, deep dive into Stride, the protocol, but we're going to use Stride as a jumping off point to cover some of the hottest topics um, just within the the broader space of liquid staking protocols in general. And I think we're going to get into a lot of fun stuff that's not only going to be relevant for Stride, the Cosmos and Celestia, but also for Ethereum as well. So maybe before we get into some of those broader themes, Aiden, can you just give us an overview of the architecture of Stride. Um, and if you could touch on maybe some of the the stuff that uh, listen, listeners who spend most of their time in the Ethereum ecosystem and kind of have this workflow of sort of Lido and Ethereum, the protocol won't be as familiar with things like interchain accounts, the liquid staking module, stuff like that. Definitely. Um, so Stride is a liquid staking protocol in Cosmos. Like Lido and Ethereum, Stride takes in token deposits and issues ST tokens against them. Uh, so for example, Stride will take in an, a TIA deposit and issue SCTIA against that. It auto compounds rewards. Um, and uh, unlike Steeth on Ethereum, uh, SC tokens do not rebase. So the exchange rate between tokens and SC tokens, it's not one-to-one, -one, it actually changes through time. Uh, so if you hold um, you know, one SCTIA at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, you might have 1.1. TIA against that one SCTIA. Uh, architecturally, Stride is an app chain. So most uh, liquid staking protocols in other ecosystems, they're built as uh, smart contracts. And for end users, this doesn't make a huge difference. Um, but Cosmos, the uh, sort of architecture of most Cosmos protocols is as app chains. And um, one thing that this allows Stride to do is it can support lots of different SD tokens in parallel. Uh, the way that this works is all of the core protocol business logic lives on the Stride blockchain, and it can open IBC connections to other blockchains. And uh, it's the liquid staking logic flows through those IBC connections. So one reason this is helpful in Cosmos is you have these very minimal blockchains, for example, Cosmos Hub, uh, doesn't support smart contracts. Celestia doesn't support smart contracts. Uh, some blockchains do have virtual machines like Osmosis, they have Cosmosm, um, but many do not. And the way that Stride supports liquid staking is through something called an interchain account. 
Um, all this is, is it's an account on another blockchain controlled by Stride. And the reason you need something like this is uh, with liquid staking, users deposit tokens, they're all pooled, and then Stride will stake and unstake those tokens on behalf of users. The logic to stake and unstake, that's the part that you need the interchain account for. So uh, every day or every epoch, Stride will send a message which batches stakes and batches unstakes, aggregating deposits across the epoch period. Um, and that's sort of the high level idea of an interchain account. Um, there are some other differences, you know, Stride has its own validator set. So Stride uses interchain security, um, which has sort of some other imp interesting implications. Um, LSM is another sort of interesting topic that I'm sure we'll get into, but at a very high level, that's, that's how Stride works. Awesome. Now, um, I actually want to want to double click there, Aiden, as well on the relationship with, um, the Cosmos hub and what interchain security is. So can, can you give us an overview of what uh, basically like the hub is, uh, again, for listeners who might not be as familiar and what this concept of interchain security is and why uh, Stride opted into that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one way to think about Cosmos is it's sort of like a neighborhood and the Cosmos hub is like the model house. Um, so if you want to move to this neighborhood and build a house, typically what chains do is they'll fork the Cosmos hub. It's like the minimal, simple, version of a blockchain built with the Cosmos SDK. Um, in terms of what the Cosmos hub does, I mean, it issues the Atom token. Uh, so that's its its main purpose, I would say, uh, or ha has historically been its main purpose. It also has- Still working uh, on that main purpose. Still, <laughs> still working on it. <laughs> um, the, the main product offering that the Cosmos hub has is uh, a form of restaking called um, replicated security. There are, uh, I guess replicated security is also just one form of, um, of restaking offered by the Cosmos Hub or in Cosmos. So soon Cosmos Hub will have partial set security, but currently the service that the Cosmos Hub provides is called interchain, uh, or sorry, replicated security. And this means uh, a different blockchain can inherit the validator set of the Cosmos Hub. The reason a blockchain might want this is the validator set of the Cosmos Hub is extremely decentralized and economically very secure. Um, you know, like the validators have uh, strong reputations. Cosmos Hub was one of the earliest proof of stake chains. I think it launched back in 2019. And um, they also have economic stake. So with Stride, for example, as a liquid staking provider, it's really critical that the underlying validator set that runs the Stride protocol is secure because liquid staking providers can have huge TBLs. So Stride could, you know, theoretically one day have billions or tens of billions in TBL like Lido on Ethereum. And uh, the way that IBC works, the validator set technically custodies those tokens. Uh, so you want validators that are very reputable and that won't, you know, rug the protocol and take those tokens from users. Um, so Stride was the second blockchain to use interchain security after Neutron. And uh, you can kind of think of this like the Cosmos Hub outsourcing its functionality to other blockchains in its ecosystem. Neutron does smart contracts. Stride does liquid staking. Um, and yeah, that's that's a bit about ICS. Awesome. And um, I, I'd be curious as well, in from your perspective, just because you know when you look at from the almost from like a, a business perspective with Stride, uh, I think one of the unique things about Stride as opposed to something like Lido on Ethereum or Jito over on Solana is that you're, you know, you're trying to be kind of this solution for multiple different app chains, right? And uh, obviously there's a, there's a power law in terms of assets that are actually widely adopted and have liquidity within Cosmos. So uh, let's, let's just take the approach of Atom in general. Like obviously that was a massive early first win for Stride, I would say. So can you talk about some of the other almost like softer benefits as well? Like kind of this, this is going to foreshadow a, a topic that we're going to discuss quite a bit later, but kind of this idea of alignment being important from who you were sourcing security from. And then if you could actually touch as well on the idea of protocol owned liquidity um, and, and how that was actually beneficial for the stat, uh, staked Adam, Adam pair. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Actually, I'd love to hear uh, John's take on alignment as well. Um, I don't really know how to define it. Uh, one thing I would say is stride. So for stride, I would say alignment means getting out of the way of other protocols, letting them do their jobs. 
Um, with liquid staking, the leverage that a liquid staking protocol has over a base layer or the effect that it has is the decentralization of the validator set. And this is really critical for any blockchain, you know, like decentralization is the only thing that separates blockchains from the traditional tech industry. So when stride is aligned, we don't want to like, you know, help the cosmos hub do, uh, interchain security better. We just want to get out of the cosmos hubs way and make sure that it's, uh, as decentralized as possible. Um, well, so I think what you're alluding to might be uh, protocol and liquidity. And the way that this works is when stride opted into interchain security, um, there's an exchange of payment for a service. So Stride pays 15% of its inflation and revenues that it has from liquid staking to Cosmos Hub in exchange for this security service. Um, this is a great deal for Stride. So Stride's economic security went up 10x after it opted into ICS and its uh, cost basis for security went down 10x. So like the security per unit of spend went up like 100x, which is a huge win. Um, but in addition to this, Stride also got uh, what's called protocol on liquidity. And this was 450,000 Atom from the Cosmos Hub. So the Cosmos Hub community pool took, um, I think about $4.5 million and it deployed it in an ST Atom Atom pool on Neutron. Uh, the reason this makes sense for the Cosmos Hub is uh, typically bootstrapping and sustaining these pools requires liquidity mining incentives on behalf of the LSP. But for Cosmos Hub, there's all this idle liquidity just sitting in the community pool. So why not, uh, assuming the protocol is sound and won't get hacked, why not take that liquidity and deploy it throughout DeFi? Um, and this has a, it's a way to get over this bootstrapping problem of uh, bootstrapping Atom DeFi throughout different chains. Um, there was an additional ask. So I think this worked really well for Cosmos Hub and they ended up deploying more protocol and liquidity. So Sunny from Osmosis asked for an additional 900K Atom, um, about $10 million. And that is now deployed on Osmosis. I think it's earning something like 100K annually. Um, and the hub can always take it back so that the ownership resides with the hub. Uh, Stride is a similar deal with Osmosis. So 20 million Osmo have been deployed to the SD Osmo Osmo pool. Um, and hopefully more protocol and liquidity will, will be deployed in the future. So it's, it's this sort of nice symbiosis between other chains and Stride where Stride gets some TVL and starts to bootstrap uh, DeFi around the SD token. And the community pool with very little uh, financial risk, there's no real risk of impermanent loss. They can help bootstrap some of this DeFi. Um, so that's how protocol and liquidity works. Yeah, for the alignment stuff, worth double clicking on that. Um, you were saying to uh, chime in a bit there. Yeah, just for the, like the like the, the word gets like butchered all the time now, just because of the whole like Ethereum alignment meme, blah blah blah. Um, with, I mean, like what we're concretely talking about here is like incentive alignment. Um, and with LSTs, uh, like we have a very concrete that thing that we're talking about. Um, so it's a print, it's a very clear principal agent problem. Um, let's print yeah, principal agent problem, um, between two different parties here. Uh, what, like we're always talking about whether it's stride or Lido, um, you have this issue between the liquid staking protocol itself. Um, and then the users of that protocol. So Steve holders or steel holders or SD Atom users. Um, and also similar one between um, that uh, liquid taking protocol. So stride Lido and the underlying like chain itself. Um, and those actually are two different problems to solve, which is something that like sometimes gets overlooked is like there is a different uh, principal agent problem between like the holders of the asset, which are like your direct customers and the chain itself. Um, and like that, that is what is often like a very, very difficult problem to kind of solve in these. Um, and like what you see in um, Ethereum world is like Lido is the main one who's pushing this forward is this idea of like dual governance. Um, so concretely, the idea is like, hey, Lido uh, token holders, like they have all the governance rights. So we can alleviate this by giving uh, like veto rights to Steve holders. So now like all of our customers can, you know, like veto anything. If we try to do something crazy, that's like against their interest. Like, hey, we want to make like 100 percent fees tomorrow or like go nuke the validator set or something like that. Um, and that is supposed to kind of like act as a proxy for also alignment with the host chain itself. So solving both principal agent problems. Um, but it is like a kind of fundamentally difficult and possibly impossible thing to solve there of like what like what is the host chain of like how, like how do you define that here um and that's what like uh, someone like danny ryan has like criticized like, like the dual governance thing on lido for it's like oh steve holders like don't represent all of the ethereum community um and so the the kind of fundamental fundamental question is like okay but like 
what, like, what is the right thing to be aligned with? Like, what, what is the right representation of, uh, you know, the Celestia community that we should be giving uh, governance rights to? Should it be that Stia holders are allowed to veto uh, stride decisions that affect them? Or should it be like a full Celestia governance vote? Or should it be some sort of social consensus among Celestia that's able to like veto things against them? Um, so that is like, just like a very difficult problem to solve. Um, and so like that, that is like a, a number of the things that Stride has done with their existing um, products already has like also kind of worked in this direction of like, okay, what are some ways you could alleviate that? Um, and one of the things that they've added, for example, like with uh, ST Atom and ST Osmo is okay, we can have a council from these host chains, like from Osmosis um, or the Cosmos hub that is ratified by their own governance that like understands the Cosmos hub really well. And they can propose to tr Stride like, hey, like these are the validators we want as opposed to like stride handpicking them themselves. Um, and similarly, um, for Celestia is a slightly different round of saying like, hey, we're, we're gonna try not to be super opinionated. We're just gonna take what you guys say of a more like copy staking approach of like whatever validator set you guys have already picked, like we're just gonna honor that and try to like distribute like relatively accordingly to that. Um, but you do still have like a little bit of this fundamental problem at the end of the day of like, okay, but what if Lido or stride wants to deviate from that, you know, at the end of the day, their governance does have power to do that. Um, and so, uh, a, re a really good post, um, it was in the Ethereum context, but it's fully applicable here too, is Mike Neuter had a post um, uh, probably a couple of months back on like Lido attack vectors talking about exactly this of like, and, and this is what I, I think like alleviates a lot of it. It's just like the natural incentives are there for like Stride or Lido others to behave. Like most of the attack vectors in practice are like if these LSPs try to go off the rails, they mostly just nuke their own protocol as opposed to like actually harming the underlying protocol. You can mess with the validator set a little bit and then you just like kind of get cut out and you destroy your own product. Um, but it also is a particularly fun problem to solve in the context of Stribe when they're doing many different solutions um, and different chains may have a different answer to like, what is the right answer to host chain alignment with Celestia it may look different than the answer to what it, what it should look like with the Cosmos hub. Um, so it's fun to keep playing around with those. Completely. I mean, it's such an interesting question to delve into because one of the other differences in between these different ecosystems is that they've started, they have very different origin sort of points, which led to different path dependency issues. So we're going to talk about this quite a bit, but you know, if you look at one of the, um, the dichotomies of uh, Ethereum compared to other proof of stake systems is Ethereum started as proof of work. And there was this period during the merge where staking had this horrible UX and that led to this divergence in the adoption of staking versus liquid staking that you see in, for instance, Cosmos or Solana, where there's a low, overall lower stake rate, extremely high penetration of liquid staking. And it's the exact opposite in Cosmos, very high native stake rate, very low liquid staking, same with Solana. So we can get into that. But I, I want to double click on this, this issue of alignment and just underscore some of what John said there. And maybe to add these, these sorts of categories of alignment here, you know, Liquid staking is something that is extremely close to the metal. You can see this probably most clearly in Ethereum today, where there's a lot of uh, vigorous discussion around Solana or, or around uh, Lido rather. And I think there's a couple of different reasons for that, which is one, in some sense, staking pool operators, you know, they're very close to the metal in the sense that you could actually, if you were to basically control a certain amount of stake, you could mess with the operations of the chain. Uh, then there's this other issue is kind of giving up control, right? Of the, uh, you know, maybe your maybe it's your values or how how your validator set, uh, set is selected, that type of thing. And then there's also this this other component, which is many chains like Ethereum are starting to view their export and primary product as money. And you could view the liquid staked derivative as a competitor to that form of money. And that forms its own sort of tension as well. So I want to get into that. Uh, but let, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the solutions that have been proposed in Cosmos land and how they rhyme a little bit with some new suggested approaches towards staking in Ethereum. So why don't we start, uh, Aiden, could you give us an overview of what the liquid staking module, the LSM is, and how that alleviates uh, some of these concerns? Yeah. Um, so the liquid staking module in Cosmos or LSM is primarily two things. First, it is a regulatory framework around liquid staking. And second, it's a big UX improvement for the existing uh, way to liquid staking Cosmos. Um, I'll touch on both of those. So on the, on the regulation side, uh, Cosmos Hub has been around for a long time. And um, Jay and Ethan, the founders, you know, they've thought a lot about, uh, about liquid staking and staking and some of the incentive, uh, potential incentive misalignment um, that could arise from that. 
So I think there's a lot of uncertainty to John's points. Like there's all these open questions around like, what actually are the incentives? Would a liquid staking protocol ever actually attack the base layer? Probably not, but there are some unknowns. Uh, so on, uh, on Cosmos Hub, one solution to um, allow the safe growth of liquid staking uh, in the view of the Cosmos Hub was to add two safety features. The first is uh, a global cap. So it's just like, it limits liquid stake to 25% of overall network stake. And this gets rid of a lot of uh, potential attacks. So for example, the liquid staking, liquid staking protocols, even if they all come together, they can't halt the chain because you need 33% of stake to do that. Um, so that's that's sort of like this idea of the global cap. It's it's sort of a, a sledgehammer, I would say. It's like a, it's a big blunt tool. It's not very fine grained, but it sort of works for what the Cosmos Hub wanted. The second is the validator bond. <clears throat> the idea behind the validator bond is um, it forces validators that want to participate in liquid staking to put up additional capital. Um, and it helps mitigate some of these worries around the principal agent problem. Uh, so if a validator participating in liquid staking actually ended up going rogue and uh, attacking the, the base layer in favor of the liquid staking protocol, um, its validator bond would be slashed. And the validator bond is, uh, there's all kinds of things you can do to play around with this. You could increase the slashing rate on validator bonds. You could increase the yield or decrease it on validator bonds. Um, but currently on Cosmos, the validator bond is just sort of normal stake that's put up solely by the validator. Um, so it gets the validators to have some skin in the game. So that's the regulation side. Um, on the UX side, uh, Mike, you actually, I, I, that was a great point you brought up, which is on Ethereum, there's this transition from proof of work to proof of stake. So um, when users were initially staking, they could choose between a liquid staking protocol or natively staking. Um, and especially early on, I mean, I, I think both of you know more about this than I do, but my impression was, especially early on, it was pretty hard to natively stake. So liquid staking was very attractive. Uh, on Cosmos, it's very different. So staking has been around for a long time. It's super easy. You just go on Kepler, you stake. So most uh, tokens in Cosmos are staked. And there's this unbonding period. And because of the unbonding period, which is 21 days on Cosmos Hub, it takes a while to get your stake out and then put it in a liquid staking protocol. Um, and this has been a big hurdle to, to user adoption. So the idea behind LSM is, well, what if you could uh, get an NFT that represents your stake instantly? So you don't have any of these problems of instant unbonding and like short and long range attack factors. Um, you just get an NFT that represents your stake and you can deposit that into liquid staking protocols in exchange for LSTs. So the onboarding flow to go from natively staking to liquid staking is like a matter of minutes, whereas previously it was weeks. All right, that was a that was a really good point. Let, let's take those in reverse order there. And actually, so that was a really good explanation of kind of the value proposition of, again, this is a funny path dependence thing where the really horrible UX for Ethereum stakers at the beginning led to high adoption of liquid staking, low native. Cosmos has the opposite problem where it was super easy to stake in the beginning, very high percentage of native stakers as opposed to liquid stakers. And now we're trying to move those native stakers over into liquid staking by making the, the flow a lot easier. So can you, Aiden, one, one thing that um, I would just find particularly interesting is there's a fungibility uh, constraint on LSM shares, right? So that NFT that you were talking about, those aren't perfectly native one-to-one. -one. It's specific to the validator that you're staking to, and then your own uh, sort of delegation record, I believe is the term. Um, and so these are not very native, or these are not very fungible. Uh, but, oh, sorry, maybe. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, but... Uh, so what and fungibility uh, for those of you who listened to the the liquid staking session on bell curve we know it's very very important um so how does on the back end stride manage these different non-fungible positions and produce something that is maximally fungible as the lst yeah um so it's kind of an interesting implementation detail of lsm that you get something that looks like an nft uh the reason that looks like an nft is when you get a plot of these tokens, uh, there's an address stored on chain that gets all the staking rewards for that NFT. Um, I think there's different ways that the LSM possibly could have been built where you actually don't have LS, uh, where you don't have N NFTs. And instead you have a liquid staking token per validator. Um, 
but uh, that this is sort of the way that the, the development shook out. So these NFTs are very hard to use in DeFi. Like really they're just infrastructure for liquid staking protocols. If you went to a lending protocol, for example, with this NFT, like it's an NFT with like a certain staking reward address. And it's like, there's a certain number of tokens and it's just really hard for, for something like that to be integrated in DeFi protocols, which are already so complex. Um, so like you said, uh, what users typically do is they'll take this NFT and they'll deposit in a liquid staking protocol like Stride. Um, if you deposit your NFT into Stride, you get ST Atom in return instantly. So your user journey ends there. You take your ST Atom, you can go, you know, trade it, sell it, use it as collateral, whatever you want. Um, on the back end, what Stride is doing is it takes the NFT, it transfers it back to the Cosmos Hub, it turns it back into native stake. And then once every three weeks or so, Stride rebalances delegations across the entire set. Um, there's some technical reasons for why it has to happen once every three weeks. It's not, not super important. Um, but one interesting thing here is unlike, uh, I think, uh, Lido on Ethereum uh, or Ethereum in general, Cosmos is delegated proof of stake. So for Stride to delegate to a node operator, there's no hurdle of onboarding the node operator or having them spin up additional hardware. Um, Stride can just like have a rebalancing algorithm on chain and delegate to whoever it wants. Super interesting. Yeah. What, one important thing that like this probably is kind of the point to touch on it um, that I think this design touches on is kind of like, what is the fundamental goal of what you're trying to do with this kind of protocol level like regulation uh, for liquid staking? Are you right. trying to just create like some minif minimal form of infrastructure, which is what the LSM is doing to make these out of protocol LSTs better? Or the other direction is to say like, hey, us as the protocol should just enshrine all this LST stuff and like we issue LSTs as the protocol itself. Um, and, and that is kind of like the clear delineation. Um, and so I, as you can tell from talk, like hearing about the LSM shares, like these technically semi fungible tokens that you get as a user that are in practice useless or like not intended as an end user product. It's just kind of like a piece of infrastructure that's supposed to be deposited into Stride and they actually give you the end user product. Um, the opposite direction of that that you could try to take um, is you could say, hey, like the, the protocol itself should just offer like one maximally fungible um, LST to everyone. Um, the TLDR is like, if you try to do one single maximally fungible one from the protocol, like what you end up backing into is just like the proof of stake mechanism doesn't actually super make sense anymore. And you basically end up going into like the proof of governance thing, which is what I've written about before. Like the proof of stake mechanism actually isn't needed. Um, what others are trying to do in the middle is something that um, Aiden had touched on is what could have been a different implementation is you, if you modified the proof of stake mechanism such that each validator can issue their own um, LST that is fungible like within their own validator. Um, uh, and so this is the kind of approach that if you've looked at some of the writings in the Ethereum world recently over the past few months of like where some people in Ethereum have toyed around with the idea of like, how can we change the staking me mechanism? Um, like the two tier staking post that Mike had written about um, and the Donk Red had written about previously. Um, and also actually very similar um, to something that Penumbra has been working on with their um, staking tokens is the idea that like in the LSM, if say like, let, let's say Aiden and I are both uh, delegated to the, to the Coinbase validator on the Cosmos hub, like his delegation record of that, his LSM share and my LSM share would be different even though we're delegated to the exact same validator. You could implement it in a way which is more like what Penumbra is trying to do of like, if we're both uh, delegating to the same person, like we could have like that, the you would be able to have like a Coinbase specific LST that is actually fungible between us. And so you could start to see that like, okay, is that a useful thing to have? Like, is that an end user product that could be issued that for people to use? I, I still think what you basically end up with at the end of the day is like, okay, but people don't want fungible within one of the hundred validators. Um, they want like an actual maximally fungible thing, not the like, oh, this LST comes with a seven and a half percent commission that gets cut out of this one. And that one's a 5% commission. And they give you like MEV rewards and the other, like people don't want to do that. They want one maximally fungible thing. So even if you tried to do this, what's going to happen in practice in my mind is like, okay, not a protocol solution like stride like Lido, whatever, is still just going to take in these shares, issue a maximally fungible token that kind of uh, pulls that across them. And that's what the end user will end up with. Um, so that is basically kind of the guiding 
principle that this ends up coming to, to me, like at the end of the day is like, as a protocol, when you're trying to design this regulation, it should just be with the goal of what is the thing that we can design that will make out of protocol, uh, liquid staking tokens better and more competitive and safer with, uh, against each other, um, such that there are lower switching costs. They are just a safer and better product for users. Um, it's not trying to like replace them or like get them to not exist or anything like that, or replace them like with an enshrined version. It's just, how do we make this other like out of protocol thing, uh, safer and better, uh, for users? Yeah. Compl I mean, so much to unpack in there, John, but you know, basically, you know, I think if you brought, I'm, j I'm just remembering back now to some of the conversations that I've had about uh, liquid staking in the past and fungibility is like a, a core design uh, constraint or design principle of, of something like Lido. And probably the reason for that is because there are such power law effects to liquid staking and liquidity is so crucial. Like you, liquidity and fungibility kind of walk hand in hand and uh, you, you definitely wouldn't want to uh, destroy that. So yeah, I think that's, I mean, this is kind of like pretty nerdy stuff here, but I, I find it sort of beautiful actually that uh, it's it's an interesting sort of alchemy that uh, protocols like Stride perform and they take these sort of non-fungible LSM shares and they produce something that is fungible, uh, which I find super interesting. I also do think as a side note, I don't want to go too far down this, that, down this tangent, but I, I think that the liquid staking module in general will end up, you know, history will, will show that this is the right approach to take, that some form of regulate like in protocol regulation uh is probably the right way that a lot of these different protocols are going to ultimately end up walking down um and even though it's been moderate uh, adoption so far i have i have a lot of hope for it um as a design principle i think it's been very good uh okay last last sort of detail on this is one uh, how do we get the 25 percent cap cap <laughs> like this is also one of my favorite parts about cosmos versus ethereum this was ethereum this would have been like a year multiple research posts and cosmos just kind of go 25% feels about right. Let's give it a shot. We can change it. Um, but how'd we end up on 25%? Yeah, that is a great question. So um, there's sort of this uh, edge case in LSM where let's say you hit the 25% cap. Um, and then, uh, so you have 25% liquid stake, 75% native stake. Now native stakers start on bonding. Uh, the share of liquid stake to native stake starts to go over 25%. There are other like solutions that you could come up with here. For example, you could force liquid staking protocols to undelegate um, and then like put that stake in a buffer and then the yield for each LSP goes down, but it's a bit tricky to do that. So uh, the, the simple solution today is like, yes, technically the cap is 25%, but if you hit the cap and then native stakers start unstaking, it actually goes above 25%. Um, the big mental threshold is 33% because that's where liquid staking protocols can halt the chain. So with the 25% cap, I don't have the math in front of me, but I believe you'd need, uh, yeah, you'd need, you need 25% of native stake, uh, or sorry, 25% of all stake. So one third of native stake would need to unbond for the liquid staking protocol to be, uh, 33% of the network. And that's just a massive amount of stake to unbond. So it felt like with the 25% cap, the chance that all liquid staking protocols collectively actually reach 33% of network stake, uh, like felt very low. Um, and I think most, uh, like even the critics of liquid staking agreed on this to your point, it is like a little bit hand wavy. Uh, I don't have strong evidence for this. Um, but that's, that's sort of how we got to that number. No, oh, I love that. That's great. And, uh, one more, I, I want to just zoom in on that third point because yeah, this has been an, uh, this has been of interest to me for a little a little while in terms of mitigating principal agent problem and uh, you know requiring validators to post a bond. There are many different ways that this could get implemented, uh, and I feel like you could actually dedicate an entire podcast episode to just the design space for something like this alone. But John, for for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with kind of the the trade off of requiring um, validators to post a bond or something like that, can you just give like an ELI five overview of Again, why that is the case, and what are some of the different trade-offs and different flavors of how that could get implemented? Yeah, sure. Um, so, like the, the basic idea is the kind of like fundamental trade-off you're trying to do here is the the higher that the self bond you require out of validators, in theory, the more skinning the game that that validator has. So you have mitigated the principal agent problem uh, more of like, okay, they actually have skin in the game. They're, you know, this validator isn't just going to go to something, go do something stupid, get slashed and just like get the user's money slashed because like they have skin in the game, they'll get slashed too. Um, so that in theory is why like a higher bond is better. 
Um, on the lower side, the, the benefit of that is that basically it just makes it a whole lot easier and it's much more capital efficient. So if the bond is too high, what happens is, okay, I'm some random guy at home. Like I want to run like, you know, I, like I'm pretty responsible. I want to run a validator and get some delegated stake from people, but like, I don't have a million dollars to go put it myself. Now, maybe I can't be competitive as a validator because I just don't have enough money to do a self bond. So you kind of self limit yourself of like, all right, you cut out the little guys who aren't able to put the capital costs up themselves. Um, and you just make the system generally less capital efficient because you can't liquefy the stake. Um, so the, like the extreme stance that you take on this is you just don't have any in protocol delegation, which is itself uh, implicitly just a 100% self bond requirement. Um, and this is what like Ethereum does. And so what happens in practice when you go like all the way in this direction is everyone just evades the mechanism and you end up with zero skin in the game anyway, because everyone just says, screw this. I like, I'm not putting up 32 ETH myself. And the majority of people end up saying, all right, here, Lido, like take all my money, Coinbase, like you take all my money. And then they're entirely putting up the user's money. Um, and so like, if you look at like Lido's, uh, like their node operator registry, um, like their whitelisted set or Coinbase validators today, they're not like self bonding their own money. And they're just like taking all the user's money and doing that. Um, so what is this balance of, can you have like a number that is reasonable and gives them some skin in the game, but isn't so big that it cuts out the little guy and also just incentivizes everyone to kind of just like cheat the mechanism anyway, and just get it all delegated to them out of protocol anyway. Um, and so it like, interestingly in the self bond of the LSM, it is like called a self bond um, because in theory that is like what it is supposed to be, but there's obviously no way for you to like actually perfectly regulate that. Um, so for this like self bond, like Stride can, it, it's not the way it's a, that they do it today, but like they can decide to like, hey, we are going to put up the self bond for this validator. Um, and that can sound like a bad thing because then like, oh, okay, we just defeated the self bond. But it can also sound like a good thing to some degree if it's used responsibly of like, hey, what if we make a really high self bond and then uh, liquid staking protocols like Stride kind of subjectively say, hey, if you're Coinbase, like we're not going to front any of the self bond for you, like you put it up yourself. But for the smaller validators that we delegate stake to, like we'll help you out and we'll put up like half your self bond for you because we understand that like you don't have the money. Um, and so like that sounds like a good thing. Um, and so like that is kind of the fundamental problem of like what is the objectively right number that perfectly balances oh you mitigate the principal agent problem but you like have the right capital costs for the little guy and balance all these things that number just does not exist um so in the same way that 25 percent is a little bit like ah this like seems about right 251 like sounds about right of like it's a non-zero amount of money that they're going to put up but isn't going to like squish the little guy out completely but is like enough to like mitigate it so it's like this seems like a reasonable number, um, but like, where do you put that number? I, like, th there is no perfect answer to it. Um, and in theory, anything that you put up can always like kind of can be evaded out of protocol if it's too extreme anyway. Yeah. So would, would it be safe to say that in general, what we're trying to do here with these sorts of mechanisms is, yeah, it's almost like a lot of, a lot of this, one of the problems with crypto is that we don't really have a, a stick with a lot of things, right? So we're almost trying to create these regulations that are going to the, the end result will be something that's beneficial over a long period of time for users. And a lot of what has been you know, applied so far is basically like an abstinence policy for sex. It's like, just don't do it. Well, that doesn't work because people will then just evade and not use those regulations. So we have to find a way you know, to find some sort of middle ground where responsible actors, maybe there is a little bit of social pressure. It's like, hey, you should participate in the LSM because this is in the best uh, you know, long-term you know, value proposition for all of us and uh, don't do stuff out of protocol. So I think that's an interesting analogy to use. And one one additional implementation detail that I would say there as well is you could mess around with uh, slashing requirements as well, or slashing conditions where you could say, okay, we'll just, just slash um, the self bond part of it and not anything that gets delegated. So again, why design space there in general? But uh, moving past the, the LSM, and, and maybe this is where we can get into a little bit about um, some of the differences even in between like Ethereum and Cosmos in general. Like one of the one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about is that Ethereum had it didn't really have the it had to do all of this stuff first um, in a sense and figure a lot of this out. And now Cosmos kind of has the the benefit of it has a more mature staking uh, ecosystem, but a slightly less mature liquid staking ecosystem. And so I think there are some that there are definitely some lessons um, that could be learned. 
And I would just love to get a sense um, from you guys. Uh, and maybe John, you touched about this, honestly, and you had a, uh, expanded on this a little bit in even previous portions of your of your blog, but you you started to touch on some of the proposals that are coming up in Ethereum land for things like two tier staking and stuff like that. Um, can you kind of walk us through what are some of the the changes that are coming down the pipe potentially in the Ethereum ecosystem? And then we can kind of compare and contrast some of the demand drivers for liquid staking adoption in between these two ecosystems. So I'm skeptical that these changes will happen um, for the just obvious reasons with Ethereum of like, it would take a huge amount of momentum to like meaningfully overhaul the proof of stake mechanism and like get a lot of social consensus on it where I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, that's my like general intuition on the situation right now. Um, but like m most of the stuff that's been proposed in Ethereum is uh, similar to the liquid staking module in that there is some notion of like, in, in protocol awareness of this kind of like self bond mechanism of anyone can put up like as a validator, you know, I put up say one ETH and then I can get delegated another 31 ETH and you can play with whatever numbers you want. I think in Don Crud's post, I mean, he put 20 to one, but I mean, you could change the number. That was just like an example. Um, so very similar idea there of like whatever amount that I put up, I can in proportion to that, get some amount delegated to me uh, against which you can issue a liquid staking token. Um, so that all sounds like quite similar. Um, the, the main difference I would say um, that pretty much all of the Ethereum posts um, between like Donkrod, Mike, um, and Vitalik had had some on that they kind of contemplated is something that the liquid staking module, at least initially the way it's implemented, does not do. Um, and it is what uh, Aiden had touched on it before, and that is kind of differentiating uh, the treatment between the self-bond capital and the delegated capital. Um, so in particular, um, what some of these other kind of like Ethereum ideas floating around have been, it was like, okay, we could uh, give different interest rates to the two different tiers. Um, and you can also apply different slashing rules to the two different tiers. Um, so you could, for example, like pay a higher yield um, to the self-bonded tier as opposed to um, uh, the delegated tier to kind of like compensate them for the, uh, the additional lack of liquidity and the higher slashing risk because you wouldn't slash them. Um, and so, I, I, I don't know that that makes a ton of sense from thinking about it more and more of like, like really just putting in any kind of like higher yield for that just incentivizes going around the mechanism to like make another LST against the self bond anyway. Um, and in practice, the market is always just going to set whatever is the right, like the right overall rate of like, let's say that, you know, you set the difference too high. And so uh, the the, the delegated validators like they're making too much money well what are they going to do that you just like kind of like return that money to users in, in the form of like a negative commission or if you make the difference too low or the same or even give them like zero percent yield on the self bond they just charge a higher commission against the yield that is given to users so the market is just always going to correct with commissions whatever the yield is anyway um mm -hmm. the the more interesting and fundamental part um that matters is uh what some of them have contemplated doing is removing all slashing risk for the delegated stake um, and limiting all slashing risk entirely to um, the self-bonded stake. Um, so that is something that is interesting. It is like, it is kind of just like basically an admission that economic security numbers today of when people say like, oh, we have economic security of X because Y amount is staked. Uh, like that number is like a little bit, like not super perfect in that like, it's all delegated stake. Um, and so like, that's not the amount of money that like actually gets slashed by the person who's doing the action. So they're not like actually incentivized to do that. Um, so removing the slashing on the delegated stake and limiting it to the amount of self-bonding stake is saying like, hey, this is what like the bad guy is actually going to lose if they do the bad thing. Um, like they will actually lose X amount of their own money. And it's kind of saying that like, this is really the economic security at the end of the day. It's like, what will the person who does the bad thing like actually lose? Um, and so I, I, I think that like intuitively that like does kind of make sense. Um, and the idea of like why you would want to do that in particular is that it kind of helps fix this problem that like fundamentally exists with staking today and that you see in like delegated proof of stake of I as a user, uh, among other factors, one of the factors that I'm picking on is like, is this a good validator that is just going to like screw up and get me slashed and then I'm going to lose my money. Um, I obviously yeah. don't want to do that. So what people will do in practice is they will overcorrect and they will use just like brand among other reasons as kind of like a proxy for safety of like Coinbase is responsible. I see that they have 20% of the stake. Other people trust them. They're reputable. I'm going to give them all my money. I know that they're not going to get slashed or like do anything funny with it. Um, and so when you entirely remove the slashing risk 
and you say like, hey, no matter which person you decide to delegate to, like you're not going to get slashed anyway, don't worry. The user should have a much higher toler risk tolerance of like the risk of slashing is removed. So they should be able to like vote with their conscience more of like, okay, I can just like delegate to the smallest guy in the validator set because I want to help decentralize the validator set. He's like a pretty good guy. Like I know him, I'm friends with him. And like, even if he screws up, I'm not going to get slashed anyway. And so you should get a bit more distributed validator set. Um, so that part does make sense. It definitely like lowers that calculation in your head. Um, that being said, there is still the calculation in your head of like, okay, but like, a, what if a different validator is like offering me different rewards of like, what if this guy at the top is like doing timing games and like juicing their MEV rewards and like he has a higher right. like yield? Well, that like kind of still matters to me. Um, and so you don't like entirely remove that, um, but it does at least kind of reduce the barrier of like users worrying about this risk in the back of their heads when they kind of pick a delegator um, and elect to them. Um, it also helps mitigate just like a lot of random tail risk scenarios that like LSTs create of like, hey, like what if we have all of DeFi based on LSTs? Um, like that is what everything is based on. And now you have an incentive potentially for someone to take over the validator set and just intentionally get all of it slashed because like they have some short position open or they're going to profit from a bunch of liquidations if this thing depegs. Um, you kind of just get rid of that risk because now the asset like actually like can't really move away from slashing. Um, so it, it's a bunch of trade-offs in those. Um, but like in, in general, it is like a reasonable acceptance that like, Hey, this entirely delegated capital probably isn't providing like a whole lot of incentive compatible, like economic security anyway. So can we just remove a bunch of these other risks by getting rid of the slashing? Um, and uh, my expectation is not that that I, that will happen in Ethereum. I would expect other chains to play around with that, particularly in Cosmos as other chains are going to play around with different variations of the LSM. I think it makes sense for other chains to play around with this of like, we should just like not slash um, delegated stake or like treat it differently in some other manner, or even just give like the first tranche of slashing to the self-botted stake. And then after all of that has been slashed, then only start slashing the others. Uh, like there's different games you can kind of play with it. Um, I, I would definitely expect people to start playing around with that as people have more variations of the LSM. Yeah. I want to zoom in there, John, on one thing that you were starting to talk about, which was uh, the validator selection process. And maybe, maybe we can um, shift to that because that, that was another part of the reason why, you know, when we talked about liquid staking protocols being really close to the metal of proof of stake chains, like th this was a huge part of that, right? Basically validators having, or uh, chains having some opinion, right? Opinionated approach to what their validator set ultimately ends up looking like. Um, Aiden, as, as the, uh, you know, one of the founders of Stride, where you've been a liquid staking provider for multiple different proof of stake protocols, each with their own sort of opinionated version of what their validator set should look like. Can you kind of walk us through a, how chains think about this? And then what are some of the different methodologies that Stride um, has approached uh, with basically yeah, basically helping select the validator set or like what influence does Stride have uh, over the validator set, so, so to speak? Yeah, the influence that Stride has over the validator set is there's a percentage of stake that Stride has and that stake Stride can delegate to any validator in the set. Um, the reason it can delegate to any validator is again, delegated proof of stake. So uh, it's fully permissionless to do these delegations. The percentage of stake that Stride has across different networks varies. On the Cosmos Hub, it's on the lower end, maybe 2 3%. On Osmosis, it's actually quite a bit higher, closer to 10%. On Ebmos, it's even higher, maybe closer to 20 um, And I expect it to keep going up through time. So this is a really crucial decision for Stride. Um, although decision might be a bit of a misnomer because uh, really Stride tries to push this decision to the chains that it's supporting. Um, going back to Stride's core goals, I think uh, any liquid staking protocol should be very, as we said, aligned with host chains. Um, for validator selection, what that means typically is decentralization and network performance. Different chains have different preferences. So there's no one size fits all. Um, the default approach that Stride takes is it excludes all centralized exchanges because um, why would you want to stake to them? Uh, it's like doesn't really help uh, decentralization or network performance. Um, exclude validators with a higher than 15% commission. It's just quite high and often they're investors that are running their own validator. Um, so it's kind of a proxy for that. And then Stride delegates to the top 30 validators. Um, it uses an approach called copy staking for the top 30. So it just looks at the weights and it delegates proportional to those top 30 validators. <clears throat> um, 
The reason it's only 30 is sort of a technical implementation detail, and I expect this will increase the entire set soon. Um, the, when Stride sends these interchain messages, uh, it's much, so interchain blockchain programming is like super tricky. There's all kinds of weird edge cases that you get when you're trying to program things asynchronously versus if you just have like one global state machine. And um, there's all these like fallbacks and edge cases you have to handle if something succeeds or fails. So uh, getting a little bit technical here, but the way that Stride stakes again is it sends an IBC packet, which says like, hey, on Cosmos Hub, uh, please stake this on my behalf. Cosmos Hub does it or not, and then it sends a, a, an acknowledgement. Um, so it's much easier for like uh, Stride if everything happens atomically. So if like an entire um, batch of staking and unstaking happens atomically, and um, there's only like you know so many stake and unstake messages that can fit in a single block of transactions. Um, so across most chains, it's about like thirty. Um, but anyway, we're refactoring, and this will be hundred soon. Um, Popping back up the stack, uh, there's some different processes that Stride uses on different chains to optimize for decentralization and network performance. Um, so on Atom and Osmosis, the process is community-led. Um, Stride stakes 25% uh, of all of its stake to each quartile of the set. Um, so this ensures like a baseline level of decentralization. You know, we don't want to decent we don't want to stake everything to the top of the set or the bottom. There's trade-offs to both, so we just kind of uh, distribute things mostly evenly. But then within each quartile, uh, a neutral council on each of these host chains, uh, Adam and Osmosis, will evaluate the validators based on things like uptime, governance participation, um, uh, commissions, how long they've been in the active set, things like that. And then they get stack ranked and then delegated to accordingly. And this gets refreshed every few months. Um, for DYDX, you know, they really care about network performance. Obviously, for a, for a perps protocol, this is crucial. Um, so the validators there were selected with some feedback and help from the DYDX Foundation, optimizing for network performance and latency. Um, and for Celestia, uh, you know, Celestia is a very minimal blockchain. So the approach that Stride is taking for SCTIA is just copy staking. And for Celestia, uh, we actually will delegate to every single validator in the set. Um, so it's, we're trying to be maximally unopinionated. We got lots of feedback from the Celestia community and, um, yeah, just delegating to every validator in the set proportional to their stake uh, and then rebalancing through time. This removes the effect of uh, skewing the stake that a liquid staking protocol would otherwise have. Yeah, and, and just to underline that that last part, Aiden, for, for folks that might not be quite as familiar, one of the, one of the issues with proof of stake chains that start with native, um, the ability to delegate built in you, you end up with very top heavy validator sets because of exactly the dynamic that John was describing before, where there's kind of an early lead. There's typically a validator, you know, with a brand name, maybe it's Chorus One or Coinbase or P2P or whoever. And like, I don't really know any of these other long list of names. I know these names, they have all the stakes. So I'm just going to delegate up there. Um, so there's kind of this, this problem that a lot of uh, chains have early on in their you know, early on in their uh, life cycle where they have these very top heavy validator sets, it makes sense from the standpoint of a delegator, but it doesn't, it isn't necessarily in a chain's best interest. So maybe there are like a couple of different options that a chain could go down. And I do think there's a little bit of tension here, frankly, because they're maybe like, let's just generalize and say there are three options, which is one, you could just say, hey, uh, I don't actually really know how to construct a validator set that's maximally decentralized. Stride, could you help me out with that? And Stride has like a very detailed philosophy on what they think a validator set should look like. Then there's kind of a middle ground of this, you know, community uh, sort of approach where there's a little bit of input from Stride and a lot of in, like a good amount of input from the protocols, like that's what Osmosis did. And then there's just like a copy, which is to say, this, this is the route that we went with Celestia and just say, hey, we're just going to copy the existing validator set. And I can, the tension, and I'd be curious to get both of your guys' perspective on this is I understand from the perspective of Celestia wanting they don't want to surrender any control over what their validator set looks like. But similarly to other chains, they have this kind of top heavy validator set, right? And it actually might be in their best interest long term to give someone like Stride, who is, you could almost consider them a neutral third party uh, in some respects, uh, more control there. But I'd be curious about how you guys see that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if tension is the right word, but dynamic. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's uh, people are going to delegate their stake to the top of the set um, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, so this is definitely a problem on many chains. 
Uh, I think for now, taking one of these approaches and applying it to a chain is the simplest way to do things. Um, so for example, you know, with Celestia, they want copy staking, makes a ton of sense. Stride should just do that. Um, with Cosmos Hub, they're actually, they want something that's a bit more opinionated and that decentralizes network state. I think they're just maybe a bit, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're just more comfortable with that idea. Um, but there are merits to both approaches. So I could see some blend of these working well in the long term. Maybe after Stride builds up some trust with the Celestia community, um, improves the technology, you know, we're we're starting with one solution and progressing towards something that's more trust minimized. Maybe we would move from copy staking to something that's more opinionated. Um, that's sort of how one way I could see it playing out. Um, but here's here, John's take. I know this kind of starts to get into the proof of governance territory. So <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, it's such a tricky question because like, for you know what is the right thing for stride to do from a these chains um because particularly for someone like celestia and someone like ethereum you, stride and lido actually can't answer that question when ethereum and celestia themselves don't know the answer to that question i think like mm -hmm. most on-chain governance chains like uh the cosmos hub or osmosis like they have uh i i would say a reasonable view of like hey we're fine with being like pretty opinionated and like we want to decentralize the validator set intentionally. Like we would like to move in this direction and like on-chain governance will like have a say in like, this is kind of where should we should go. Uh, Ethereum doesn't have that on-chain governance and agreement on like, hey, this is what we want to do in the first place. Um, and Celestia has some form of on-chain governance, but also wants to lean very heavily on off-chain gover uh, off governance and emphasize that even more over time. Um, not trying to just be subject to like, you know, what do TIA token holders all want to do? Um, so then kind of the fundamentally like difficult problem with that is like, okay, let's say that we want the Celestia community to decide what is the right, you know, staking distribution. Like, like what, like what does the Celestia community like actually mean, um, in this scenario? I is it the TIA token holders? Because we kind of just said, no, it's not just the TIA token holders, but that's the simplest thing to do is just to like, say like, what do the TIA token holders like do? Like who do, whoever they delegated to is like the right thing to do. Um, and so kind of to the point of what, what I think will probably be the right natural progression is clearly for stride, having spoken to the community, uh, the Celestia community a lot, people around it, the thing that they want right now is just launch at first with like a very minimally opinionated copy staking, pretty much just copy the entire set and then remove the handful of uh, both sexes and like some people who charge like 100% commissions because they're like investors running their own validators, like remove that handful and then otherwise just like copy what we're doing. Um, and then I think as you build up more trust and work with them over time, um, and as the selected community kind of figures out what they want themselves of like, hey, this is how we want to build the validator set, then Stride can work in reflection of that. Um, because like liquid staking protocols that just kind of intuitively get this is like one of the most important things to me of like the teams that get that the best thing for them to do from a product perspective is literally to just do whatever the hell the host chain wants like and not try to like you know what is the thing that like optimizes our validator rewards on the margin that like our liquid staking protocol can get the way that you grow the fastest as a liquid staking protocol is by like having the trust of the community and building like the safest and most aligned thing for that community. And like, that's how you grow really quickly. And that's how you become money. And that's how you become the safest product for them to use anyway. Um, and so I think it's going to be this natural and just iterative progression in both uh, Stride for Stia's case, and also like Lido uh, and Steve's case in Ethereum, it's going to be just like this iterative process over time of both base layers are difficult because they don't want this like super opinionated on chain governance that just says like, hey, this is exactly what we want. Like, please just do this. Um, there, there is no clear answer. Um, so it's going to just be the kind of this iterative game over time. And it will probably get more opinionated over time, just taking more feedback from the community um, and like intentionally kind of decentralizing the validator set over time. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting to hear you say that as well, John. And, and not to, you know, speak, speak, but it, it is a... It's sort of interesting to watch how Lido and, and P2P have approached this over on Ethereum. And again, this is not necessarily anyone's fault. There, there's, there's always so many moving parts. And yeah, if we had perfect communication, then we could solve a lot of problems. But even like some of the recent timing games that have been getting played over on the sort of uh, on the Lido side of things, like 
Well, that's kind of an example where you're maximizing the MEV rewards that you're getting for your staking pool, but that's probably not what you know, someone who's working on Ethereum consensus would say is the best thing that we should be optimizing for, right? Um, obviously, we want to extend the window where we can earn rewards and extract MEV, but that puts an enormous amount of strain, frankly, on, uh, you know, sending messages around them. So, so interestingly, stuff for, uh, for stuff like timing games are actually an interesting example of why I do think the end result for a lot of these and will not even be a bad thing is a single liquid staking protocol for some of them potentially to end up with the majority or all of the stake and then just be pseudo reined in to be like this like pseudo enshrined solution where like they kind of do what the governance of the pro like whatever the community wants um, because like the the problem with something like timing games is it is actually like inherently zero sum and like arguably like value destructive because you just mess with chain functionality um so if lido has say 30 percent of stake ish which is what they have today um while they haven't done this and they, i'm sure they would not because it wouldn't be a good idea um they are explicitly incentivized um, to tell all of the validators, hey, you must play timing games or we're going to kick you out of the validator set because they will make more money if they do that, like absolutely directly because they are only a third of the validator set. And on the margin, they are picking the pocket of like some other guy's validator. If Lido has 100% of the stake, they are incentivized to tell every single validator in the set, hey, if we catch you playing timing games, we're going to kick you out of the set immediately because now you're picking from like our own pocket. Um, and then what they're incentivized to do is to be 100% just aligned with how do we maximize the value of the underlying protocol? Because the liquid staking protocol, like their value is tied to, I get some percent of whatever this underlying protocol is worth effectively and the staking system. So I want the biggest, most valuable, healthiest staking, systems, staking system underneath because if I nuke it, well, then I nuke my own protocol and like I lose money. Um, so something that like a team that really gets that, hey, the thing that is the best for the liquid staking protocol legitimately is just what can we do for the host chain that is like whatever they want, whatever is best for them, um, like is just like fundamentally really important. Um, and, and that is the direction that I think like some of this will start to go over time um, is like people will start to realize that like liquid staking protocols, the ones that really get that, hey, we're just incentivized ourselves to do whatever is in the best incentives of the chain. Like those are liquid staking protocols that are going to make the most money. and They're going to do the best anyway, because um, those are the ones that are going to grow alongside the host chain. What's up, everyone? We are now almost one month out from DAS London, the largest institutional conference in all of crypto. That's happening March 18th through the 20th, obviously in London. This one's going to be a blast. We are almost 10 times oversubscribed for tickets, which is pretty nuts. So again, we've had to lower the discount to Bell 10, still hooking you guys up in your 10% discount on Bell 10. And we've onboarded a whole bunch of new speakers. So that's Dan Tapiero of 1RT, Pascal Gauthier of Ledger, Anthony Scaramucci, the Mooch himself, Michael Sonnenschein of Grayscale, Brad Garlinghouse of Ripple, Sergey Nazarov of Chainlink, Matt McDermott of Goldman Sachs, their global head of digital assets, Stani Kulachov, Danny Masters, the list goes on. This one is going to be an absolute blast. Make sure you don't miss it. And better yet, make sure you bring your friends. We sell a four pack of tickets. You're going to get a discount on that. So find people in your company, bring your boss, bring your family, bring your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is. Just go, you're gonna get a discount if you use that team pack. Run, don't walk, make sure you go get those tickets today and cheers and see you in sunny London town. Okay, I'd be really curious. I don't wanna go too far down this dynamic, but I do I do find it very interesting because basically what you're describing there, John, is A, there are different sort of natural market structures that arise based on industry. So there are some industries which are prone to natural monopoly. So that would be like a utility provider or something like that. And the US regulates that and that's how we get around it. But what we're describing about what we're describing here is a monopoly type uh, dynamic, where in some senses that's actually beneficial, but obviously there are some issues with monopolies as well. So a really interesting example I've talked about on this podcast ad nauseum. A really interesting period of time to go back and look. Uh, it's going to sound like a funny analogy is when John D. Rockefeller was creating Standard Oil. A lot of analogies between the early oil industry and the crypto industry today. And one of the issues for them back at the time was this um, like volatile pricing. Um, of oil. And they were like, well, it'd be great if we could just find a way to fix the pricing for oil in a way that it was standard. And they did that. And the way that they did that was through monopoly. That's where you get the term fixed prices today. Um, and obviously that provided a benefit for people at the time that wanted some form of standard way that they could price out oil and that they knew the price of oil I was going to pay for in 12 months is going to be the same as it was today. We didn't have robust futures markets or anything like that back then. But obviously, over time, it was you know too much control, and over time, the interests of again 
the it's sort of a form of principal agent problem, actually. So how do you guys square? Because there are lots of infrastructure layer things that would just be better if it's like, yeah, we just have monopoly here. But is there a steel man argument for the other case? Are we sacrificing competition or something like that? Or is it just all upside? What do you guys think? There's definitely some benefits to having the kind of monopoly here, particularly, and I mean, there's also a question of, uh, like, is it possible to get around it? Um, but the kind of like benefit of like a quote unquote monopoly here is in the sense that like, I mean, like that just means maximum fungibility and kind of moneyness of the asset, which is like inherently like what most people who like hold a liquid staking token like Steve, that's like, that's what they want. They want there to be one canonical version. They don't want to think of oh, there's a, like there's a mantle staked ETH and there's a rocket pool staked ETH and there's a Lido staked ETH and there's like 20 different versions. Like, what the hell is this thing? They just want there to be like there is ETH and there is staked ETH and like that, like that's all they want to think about. Um, and so like that's why the natural kind of incentive goes towards that. Um, I, I think naturally what most of these tend towards over time is a single party being very, very large because of that, possibly a couple, a small number of them. And then what you just like really want to make sure that you have at the end of the day is okay. I like I'm the the downside of having a handful of big players is only if like they're acting against the interests of kind of the host itself. If they're really big but they're doing everything that you want and they're like serving you perfectly, then you don't care that there's one asset. Uh, mm. Like the, like there's no inherent centralization in the asset that's like bad. Um, and so it's a matter of having a system that's set up reasonably well to keep them in check such that, you know, if Lido ends up with 100% of the stake, they can't just say like tomorrow, like, hey, uh, we change our minds. We're actually just going to keep 50% of all the fees now. And like, sorry, you deal with it because we have all the power. Like that that's what you just don't want to make sure that the power dynamic is at the end of the day. Um, and so just iteratively like making changes to the staking mechanism that make the difference on the margin between different liquid staking tokens generally smaller such that the switching costs are lower and it easier it is easier to move between them in different ways um, and then I think naturally there's just going to be pricing power against um, someone like that in the long run particularly because uh, like the uh, like the version of the staking token like stia or Steeth that will actually exist for most places in the future isn't actually Lido's version, um, like concretely. And you start to like kind of see that at the end of the day of like, so the, because it is going to live on these many other chains, these other chains at the end of the day, like do have some level of power. And you're starting to see that actually with L2s today, where L2s start to realize like, hey, we've got like $2 billion of ETH in our bridge that we could stake. Why do we leave this in Lido staked ETH? Like, why don't we just make our own version of like mantle staked ETH or like whatever other staked ETH? Because like we have some bargaining power now. Um, and I think what that tends towards over time is people don't actually want like a million different versions, um, but that there is real leverage such that like you can't just have this extractive pricing power of like if the staking token underneath just starts to charge like crazy people like fees, then people on the other side are going to like fork it and have different options to like make sure that they're internalizing their own value capture. So I think that you end up with like pretty Lindy money like liquid staking tokens across like many chains for something that's like a money like asset. Um, and then just naturally their commissions are like kept in check to a very reasonable rate where they're going to end up charging. Like, what do we like? What is the value we actually provide? Like, what does it cost to run this protocol and do all this stuff? Because you're not just going to have a valueless governance token there at the end of the day that's extracting too many fees in an open permissionless system where you could fork everything, like be able to extract that much. Like, I think it's just going to get like killed by the protocol itself and other consumers who have power there. Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of what John said. Um, the way that I think about this is in the short term, I think having high competition is very important um, because it forces liquid staking protocols to build things that are aligned. Like John was saying, I think the natural incentive is to make something that is maximally aligned with the underlying protocol. Um, but if it's impossible to compete and you get a, a monopoly really early on, then uh, like that one protocol might have no competition and not build in a very aligned way. So I think in the short term, like basically what we want is just make it really easy for lots of LSPs to compete. Um, in the long term, there are these like uh, really powerful network effects, brand liquidity integrations, et cetera. We all know them um, that might tend towards one or maybe a couple of, of players. Um, and then, so in, in, in that case, I think what is really important, like John said, is regulation, keeping liquid staking protocols in check, having you know, checks and balances. Um, and also preserving uh, some sort of uh, right to exit, um, 
Mm-hmm. Those, that, so I, I think the I think things will play out differently in the the short and long term. Um, and right now, I'd say we're still in the short term phase. Maybe we're like more in the medium to long term on Ethereum. But for Cosmos, just like my perspective is just make it as uh, easy to compete as possible. And LSPs will naturally build things that are aligned, and then they'll ossify through time. Yep. Awesome. All right, guys, I want, there's one more section that I want to cover here on general demand drivers for um, liquid staking tokens. And then I want to get into, I actually want to spend basically the rest of the podcast talking about Celestia, which I feel like is its own extremely unique animal and frankly, an ecosystem that I've been really interested in and diving deeper into as well. But, you know, uh, John, in in your blog post, you, you had kind of a list of some of the different demand drivers for liquid staking in general. So that could be, we talked a little bit about the UX um, and that was a little bit of a, an idiosyncratic Ethereum specific reason, but there are other things like a robust DeFi ecosystem. Can you just kind of walk us through what some of those main demand drivers are for liquid staking protocols in general? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll kind of just like walk through the list of these. Um, I think there was like seven of them I had in the post. I mean, like the, yeah, some of the like super idiosyncratic ones for Ethereum were just like the very simple stuff that we all know that like definitely ramped up a lot of DeFi adoption at the start. And this fact that you don't have any native delegation. So this is just a way for people to delegate stake. Um, and the other part being the merge was obviously a very idiosyncratic factor. If you had this long period of time where the beacon chain was live and you could stake, but you couldn't unstake it until the merge. So the only way to have like any kind of promise of, hey, maybe I just put my money into a black hole for like five years and then I can't touch it if the merge like doesn't happen is like you need a liquid staking token. Um, so liquid tokens fill that gap. And so by the time that proof of stake came around of the merge, um, it already had like a super high adoption. Um, so those are very idiosyncratic in favor of Ethereum. Um, some of the other things, um, that are, these kind of, uh, apply, I would say pretty equally to both Ethereum and Cosmos. Um, this is where I say like not tax advice, not legal advice, whatever. I don't know what I'm talking about. Consult your accountant or whatever, depending on where you are. Um, so there's two things about particularly like reward compounding and tax efficiency, um, that a lot of people like LSTs for this reason of, again, depending on your jurisdiction, but like very often staking income. Um, that comes in the form of like, I'm just continuously receiving rewards, may be treated as income, um, which is often taxed at a much higher rate compared to say like long-term capital gains. Um, So ideally what you would like um, is to try to defer that income into capital gains rather than um, income. So often you, that is like sometimes an appeal um, for some of these non-rebasing liquid staking tokens, um, which is Stride's model. Um, This is like how like Jito's hole on Solana works. Um, and this is why uh, some people actually don't keep base teeth, they wrap the teeth. Um, it's because it doesn't rebase and so the price goes up over time. So there's a better argument that like when you sell this thing, it is actually you are incurring a long term capital gain on a price increase rather than um, taxable events along the way that's like treated as income. It's no clear guidance on this depends on your jurisdiction, but like generally that's like people do favor it for that reason. Like there definitely is real demand because of that. Um, another part is like reward, uh, just auto compounding of like whatever the baseline APR is of like, let's say the protocol issue is like 6% per year. Um, you get a higher APY if you automatically, as you get more rewards, you're just automatically like staking those rewards. Um, so then you get compounding returns over time. Um, and um, LSTs can like, like stride will automatically fulfill that role for you of like the second that they get new rewards, like every few hours, they're just like restaking that again so that you can compound rewards over time. Um, and that compares to, dep- again, depends on which staking system you're in, but like something like Ethereum, the way that it's currently constructed right now is if you have 32 ETH on a validator and you're getting more staking rewards, they just sit there and they don't earn extra rewards because it is fixed to 32 ETH per validator. So the only way that you could start compounding more rewards is once you get another 32 ETH to spin up a full new validator. Um, for a regular person that's running one or two validators, that doesn't happen in practice. You just end up with a lower APY compared to someone who has like millions of ETH and they're just pulling it and like constantly spinning up new validators. Um, so there actually are proposed fixes that should like hopefully eventually happen over time with Ethereum. Um, like Mike, uh, Noid has proposed around like a max effective balance, which I think will happen eventually. Um, yep. although probably not, probably won't happen in Petra, it sounds like, unfortunately, um, but probably in the fork after that, um, would be kind of fixing this issue of like, okay, the validator bound balance can go beyond 32. Um, and so you can automatically compound rewards. So there's ways to mitigate this, um, but that is like a real incentive that exists is the ability to auto compound rewards because you get a higher yield. Um, so that kind of applies to both. Um, and then the main big difference, um, and this has been the thing that is like very in favor of Ethereum adoption over Cosmos adoption, 
is just um, like, what are the dynamics around the muddiness of the asset and the DeFi adoption of the ecosystem? Um, and so disproportionately, what you have in the Ethereum ecosystem is this whole like buzzwordy, like it means 10 different things, but like ETH is money. Like concretely, it is the thing that like when you go to a new place, like this is the default, you know, trading pair or where, what like I'm going to use as DeFi collateral and we're going to go spend places like this is what most DeFi stuff is based on. Um, and so that means like there is higher adoption for this thing. People actually want to use the thing as opposed to what you see disproportionately in a lot of Cosmos proof of stake assets is like it's a random chain and there's no like moneyness or like utility of the asset. People buy the asset and they want to get yield. So there isn't like a big difference to them of like, hey, I already have an easy in protocol delegation mechanism. I can just go like stake it in protocol. You know, having ST Atom or ST Osmo or something else like doesn't actually have like help me if I'm just buying this thing, staking it for a year, and then I just want to like sell it after a year. It's like I don't really care. It doesn't make a huge difference. Um, so that is disproportionately kind of like affected um, the adoption in the Ethereum world versus Cosmos world a lot. Um, another quick thing is just like liquidity to sell. Um, if you want to like avoid the unbonding window, um, generally you won't be able to sell without avoiding the unbonding window if you're natively staked and people who want like fast liquidity, if you know, market changes, and want to sell really quickly is like you have a liquid staking token, you have that optionality. Um, the moneyness is the kind of like very interesting one, uh, because that's what kind of like segues into why I think Celestia is like a very interesting market. Um, like the, the largest and most interesting market, like that I would say that Stride has had so far, um, that they're launching into now. And it is because the asset has fundamentally like very different dynamics that I think over time will lead to disproportionately much higher liquid staking adoption compared to other traditional Cosmos assets. Um, and that is because it is something that more closely mimics the dynamics of like how ETH is used um, in kind of Ethereum world. And I think early on there's going to be lower adoption naturally because like it's a new coin that launched. I mean, like most investors are still vesting and locked up. Like they can't liquid to take their tokens. That's where like most of the supply is, is just like locked up. It's not actually circulating. Um, like you have all those kind of like weird early dynamics. Um, but over time you have the dynamics of this is an asset where it is supposed to be used in this like money like way across all of these Celestia rollups, where for many of them, it will be the like the base, the base gas token. Um, it is what like fees will need to be paid to down to the Celestia base layer. It is what will presumably be um, as like kind of the base gas token. And then as a very high market cap coin, it's probably going to be used in a lot of like De DeFi collateral across many of these chains. Um, so there's going to be a lot of adoption of this thing. And then what you also fundamentally have is it's going to be used on many different chains. Um, and you kind of see this in Ethereum. I've felt this for a while of the fact that like in the long run, most ETH will be used on L2s as opposed to the base layer itself is actually a driver of LSTs in the long run, because you're now fundamentally in the place where this asset everywhere it's going to be used doesn't like the base asset doesn't fundamentally have any special place anymore. Like on Ethereum, you can't pay gas in Steeth today. Like th there's no like difference kind of between these assets. Once you're already kind of holding a bridged representation of the asset anyway, you're kind of like self-selecting for people who are okay with this understanding of like, I'm holding like a wrapped representation of this asset. And it just kind of lowers the barrier to, okay, if I'm holding ETH on a rollup, like why am I not holding like wrapped steeth? And similarly, it's going to be like, all right, if I'm using like T on all these rollups to pay gas and like using DeFi collateral, it's like a wrapped version anyway, especially like, why am I not just holding like Stia and like earning more money for no reason at this point? Like, why wouldn't I just use it for all of these things? And I think that you're going to see that in practice. So it will be accepted as a gas token. and it will become very commonly used as DeFi collateral across these chains. Um, so overall, I think that they have the best shot of actually mimicking like a much higher adoption over time um, just because of these dynamics, like just makes sense for a much stronger liquid staking adoption. Yeah. And just to underscore that, that point, and th this is why I think the liquid, like bridging, first of all, just... In a sense, bridging is kind of a myth, right? Like the asset, the native asset never actually leaves the chain. It just gets locked up in different types of vehicles that export like debt or synthetic versions of that asset. And some mechanisms are more credible and safe than others. Hence the idea of the LSM being, a, you know, potentially a progenitor of this idea of kind of regulating or making more credible the vehicle that exports the sort of wrapped version. So. I think that's a, it's an extremely interesting point. And maybe Aiden, as someone who's approaching, you know, the Celestia sort of ecosystem, you know, can you 
expand a little bit on what John was saying about why it's such an interesting market for Stride specifically, and then we can talk about the the moneyness of of Tia narrative. Definitely, yeah. Um, so I'll give a quick overview of uh, where I think Celestia is at, a high level overview of where the liquid staking market is at, um, and then touch on that point. Um, so we recently put up a post outlining uh, how Stride is planning to launch on Celestia, how we're thinking about it. Um, the key headline is that SDTIA, uh, both its staking APR and utility as a monetary asset on rollups will drive demand for SCTA um, because, as John is going to get into, SCTA is modular money. Um, I think Celestia is going to be the biggest market for Stride this year, hands down, maybe in coming years as well. Um, John brought up a lot of good points about why STTA in particular makes sense. If you have these thousands of rollups, they're all using TIA. Everyone, it's like, I mean, the the, the, uh, the explanation at the end of the day isn't that complex. People just want more yield. So they're going to hold the, the staked version of the thing, not the unstaked version of the thing. And the easiest way to export the staked version of the thing is through liquid staking. Um, so uh, that's sort of how, how we're thinking about it. Um, I'm sure John is going to get into this modular money angle a, a bit more shortly. Um, in terms of what the liquid staking market for Celestia looks like today, um, Celestia is very minimal. They actually don't have interchain accounts. So uh, Stride, with its typical approach, can't launch out of the box. We built a different approach, um, which we'll be launching, which uses a multi-sig for custody on the back end. The reason for that is the only two ways to support liquid staking on Celestia today are through a centralized exchange or a multi-sig. Um, and uh, so we're going that route. Uh, we have a CIP, a Celestia Improvement Proposal, to add interchain accounts um, soon. And uh, I uh, hopefully interchain accounts will be added in the next few months. And then Stride will smoothly transition from multi-state custody to interchain accounts. Um, at a high level, our goals are to reduce trust assumptions, um, have Celestia govern validator selection, and to use battle-tested, observable, audited protocols. Um, in the long term, there are sort of interesting approaches you can take. You could build like a ZK liquid staking rollup if you have this thing called a snark account on Celestia. It makes it even more trustless than interchain accounts. You don't have to trust a validator set to uh, attest to some logic through IBC. You can actually just verify ZK proof on Celestia. Um, that's a bit further out, um, but uh, short term, multi sig, medium term, ICA, long term, ZK rollup is sort of the, the way that we're thinking about it um, right now. Um, yeah. yeah yeah and kind of on that like the like the whole like modular money thing that like people are that like is kind of the thing in celestia when people talk about tia like that that's in practice why a lot of this stuff matters um particularly to celestia i think um is because i think in practice it's not going to be like for the reasons that you said of like bridging is kind of like a myth in the sense of these wrapped assets like it's not tia is modular money it's going to be whatever version of Stia on these rollups is modular money. Like that is the asset that is actually going to be in end users' hands that they're going to really be using. Um, so it is very important in that scenario that like that's not going to happen if that bridged LST is some one of one multi-sig that has like one validator underneath that is issued by some like random protocol right. that nobody knows and like can just rug you at any moment with like a closed source protocol. Like it needs to be something that mimics the like underlying asset qualities as much as possible that needs to be built in a very safe and aligned manner that like actually mimics the properties of the underlying asset. Um, and that, that is also actually becomes an important point also uh, in addition to that. Um, uh, which is very important in Stride in my mind. And this is one of the biggest things that we thought that when we were looking at Stride and like, can anyone else build like a competing solution um, is kind of just like the neutrality of what they have actually built is so critically important for this um, because Stride is like actually an app chain where the purpose of this chain is like, hey, we take in assets, we issue liquid staking tokens and we manage your validators. Like that's it. It's not some general purpose DeFi chain that has like a DEX on them that's competing with these other people. Um, it is, hey, if you get a version of Stia on your rollup, it is bridged through Stride and it is just like a representation of a bridged asset from like an actual neutral issuer. Um, and that is going to matter a lot because particularly this version of Tia that's going to be used throughout these rollups for the reasons that we've described, isn't actually going to come from Celestia itself um, because there isn't that native smart contracting and bridging um, there's not the native LST deployed there. Like the thing that ends up being the like bridging hub 
um, for these Celestia rollups is going to be another chain. Um, and so that is what like Stride is trying to fill. Um, and the question is, is like thinking strategically from the perspective of like any of these other chains that wants to import Stia and for that to be an important part of like their economy that they're using as a gas token for DeFi, et cetera. If you're, you know, uh, a man uh, like Manta or Eclipse or whatever, just like any of these rollups is using this asset. Do you want a bridged representation of that asset that is coming through a chain that is your direct competitor, um, a chain that is going to, for example, like they are trying to be the the Stia like trading hub themselves. They want to be the DeFi hub in this whole ecosystem, and now they have the leverage over you. Um, so, it, like for those reasons, it generally doesn't make sense for me. Um, if you're one of these chains, one of these Celestia rollups, to like get that bridge rep representation, you probably don't want that coming through a chain like Osmosis or a chain like Neutron. You don't want that to be the asset issuer. You want it to come from the most neutral place possible so that you know when you're dealing with this person, you're not just like giving leverage to your direct competitors um, that like have these incentives over you. Um, you don't want to get into all of that. You just want like an actual like neutral asset representation that is bridged to your roll up. Um, and that is like a really important thing, like for stride um, and like contrasts to a lot of these other Cosmos chains that are like are looking around doing this. Um, it's like in practice, they're general purpose chains that are going to be directly competitive with these roll ups. So just thinking strategically from their perspective. They're going to want the neutral asset that is the closest representation of the base underlying asset that is the safest, the most aligned coming through just like it's just a routing hub that's kind of going through here. Um, and so that's yeah. like a really, really big advantage in Stride um, in my mind. Yeah. And du double clicking on that, this has been Stride's DNA since day one. Um, this is an early differentiator against like PeaceSafe and Quicksilver, some of our competitors. Yep. You know, their vision is to have all these DeFi applications on top. Um, I think early on, we realized that for liquid staking tokens, what you want is to export it everywhere else. You don't want to like suck in activity onto your own chain. You just want to push it and get it used in as many places as possible. Um, so Stride has always been very neutral, does one thing, does it very well. Um, and we just try and keep things simple and support other chains. Yeah, really well said. And I, I want to, for, for listeners who might be a little bit less familiar with Celestia's are a particular architecture. Uh, and, and I do want to draw a comparison to Ethereum here, but one of the things that Celestia doesn't have is native smart contract ability on the, on its base chain. So that's why there isn't, you know, you, you can't have the same type of like canonical bridges that you have between Ethereum and Arbitrum or Optimism uh, between Celestia and any of its sovereign rollups that just simply doesn't exist. Right. Um, so that, that's a big architectural difference, but I, I would be interesting. Let me can I draw this comparison and see what you guys think about this, but in a sense, Celestia and Ethereum actually converging on a somewhat similar design here in, in basically minimizing um, the the complexity of the base chain, right? Or certainly the activity on the base chain and then exporting its its native asset to its uh, ecosystem of rollups, right? Um, and it, so that's basically Ethereum, again, started very differently. There's an enormous amount of activity on main chain and now it's it's pushing its activity up to its rollup layer. But what it wants to do also is export Ethereum. Uh, Cel Celestia is almost in an, a completely different, but maybe there are pros and cons, right, to the situation. They don't have all this activity to push up, but it's even more minimally designed, which is kind of a better fit for the exporting of the money. So do, do you guys also see that as a similar, is that an apt analogy? And just what do you think about that whole dynamic in comparison? It's definitely how they're trending over time. I think that gap continues to converge of ethereum is progressively going to have the majority of just value transacted um that's in these terms is going to be on other chains probably not on ethereum itself um and uh tia is completely minimal right now where literally the only thing you could do is like just ibc out the tia token to some other chain to the point where right. you can't even have any kind of different bridge um you can't have the liquid staking protocol deployed on it natively um and in the long run, I expect that to change of uh, some of the stuff that Aiden had touched on earlier of what I think in practice will happen, although this will take probably multiple years to happen, um, is adding some kind of at least like a ZK verifier like snark accounts to the Celestia base layer so that even if we're not doing arbitrary computation on the base layer such that, you know, we can't deploy like a smart contract for a liquid staking protocol on Celestia, you can deploy uh, just a ZK verifier contract um, there. Um, uh, just a ZK verifier such that you can have some kind of off-chain logic of like a liquid staking protocol um, where this is now verified by the Celestia base chain. So you can have effectively like a ZK rollup, um, like 
like Stride built as a ZK rollup transition to that, um, that would be able to post these proofs to Celestia. That just gives you a much stronger set of trust assumptions. Um, they will never have that general purpose computation. I, I don't see any world where Celestia itself adds like general purpose, uh, like smart contracting or anything like that to the base layer. That will never happen. Um, and I think that actually is a thing that I don't think Ethereum has actually figured out still of like, where exactly on the spectrum should the base layer be of, and th this is something I've tweeted about like kind of recently um, that was highlighted yeah. by like the, the, the gas limit increase kind of conversations around that, um, where I think that Ethereum is very clear that the goal is for the majority of ETH and activity within the Ethereum ecosystem to happen on other chains um, that are supposed to happen on Ethereum L2s. Um, I don't think it is settled. What is the role of the base layer in that world? And I think that it is still like a little bit in this middle ground of it's not in the Celestia direction where it's very clear that Ethereum's message is kind of like, hey, everyone on the L1, get the hell off, like go to an L2. You do still have general purpose smart contract. And there are still like two quite different views, I would say, in a lot of the Ethereum community, where I think that there is a large subset of the Ethereum community that thinks in the long run, the Ethereum base layer the execution layer, the only purpose is really to just like you're posting commitments and it's just like verifying um, proofs in the way that like kind of like Celestia maybe eventually will in a few years that they will like actually converge to the same, same thing. And I think there's another large half of the community that says, OK, most of the activity will happen on L2s, but we actually want the, ba the base layer itself to actually be like super functional, too. It'll just only be for like the really high, you know, uh, value applications, like the most valuable DeFi, uh, the most valuable applications will still live there. And that will be viable because we're going to do like statelessness. We're going to do ZKVM. We're going to bump up the gas limits and it like will actually be useful. Um, I think the Ethereum base layer is like kind of in this middle ground where I don't think it's actually decided like which of those two directions it's going into. Um, and I think a lot of the, that is highlighted by this kind of debate um, in the last few weeks of like, should Ethereum just raise the gas limit on the base layer? Um, like Vitalik had like written in the EFAMA, it's like, yeah, like we haven't raised it in like several years now, you know, Harbor improves, like it's pretty normal. You should raise the gas limit a bit. Um, and there's kind of this like philosophical difference of will Ethereum converge to the same thing that we think Celestia will converge to where like there's really like basically nothing there but proof verification or should it still be like actually a pretty useful thing? Um, and I do think that materially changes kind of like what the architecture of the system looks like in the long run of like, where do a lot of these applications live? Um, and so that is like a pretty important thing, I think, for Ethereum to grapple with. I don't see functionality on the base layer going away anytime soon. I think you're especially going to see that in the next year when like probably the biggest meta in crypto for activity in this coming year is going to be a lot of the restaking stuff. Like all of that is rooted on Ethereum. All of the restaking and liquid restaking tokens and all the stuff that people are going to be playing with, most of that's going to be on the base layer still. Um, it's not going to be this minimal thing. Um, so I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think it's reasonable to add functionality. Um, but d directionally, I would say that they're probably moving closer over time because I think Celestia will at least add some functionality. Um, and Ethereum, most activity will still move to L2s regardless of what the base layer does. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I in that world, how do you guys, I mean, this is, we're departing a little bit, I suppose, from the liquid staking part of this, but, you know, in, in this, in, let's just say we're zooming out two to three years into the future and Ethereum has gone down the road of basically minimizing, um, you know, the role of the base layer and it kind of takes a very Celestia philosophy um, in terms of that direction. H how do those two chains compete in terms of their roll-up ecosystem? I'd be very curious to get your guys' perspective on that. So, and, and also, sorry. Do you see the majority of Ethereum rollups today seeing as Ethereum rollups? Like, is it accurate to say that these rollups are scaling Ethereum? <laughs> I'm poking John here because I, uh, uh, or or is there the possibility that they could shift over chain to architecture and like transition to sovereign rollups or something like that? I think we are going to see this continued blurring of the lines, which is why I was poking at a lot of the stuff that I was poking at earlier this year. Um, with some of the blog posts of like the L1 versus L2s and roll-up stuff. I, like, I think that if you try to abide by the old mental models of, you know, is this just an Ethereum L2 or is it like, or is it a Celestia roll-up and are those mutually exclusive and like everything needs a clean categorization? I don't think that those are going to exist anymore. I think you're going to see the blurring of the lines. And I think that we're seeing that play out in practice of what do you see multiple Ethereum roll-ups doing um, in the past just like a couple of months of like, hey, we are paying way too much money for Ethereum DA, like economically, this is just not viable for us as an application developer. This does not work for our users. This does not work for us who has a bottom line. We're going to change DA underneath. 
Um, and for now, like the clear solution to that is like, hey, we're just going to swap in Celestia underneath because it's way cheaper. Um, I think that's a trend that will continue to happen. I, I don't see any logical reason why that would not be a trend that continues and grows over time. Um, I think 4844 will definitely provide, obviously, like some additional bandwidth and mitigation to that of at least slowing down that for current existing ones. But the trend is very clear of we're going to have applications and businesses that like understand what their bottom line is. And it's not going to be an acceptable answer of like, oh, I'm paying $100 million a year for some like hand wavy notion of alignment or security that like doesn't really make sense to their application. They're going to pick what makes sense for them as a business. Um, and increasing that's going to be a number of alternative DA solutions, whether that's Celestia or Eigenlayer, uh, Eigen DA, whether it's Avail, different types of committees, whatever it is, there's going to be a lot of them. I think that continues to happen. Um, and in that world, I think that you still see Ethereum like L2s, um, where the core of their users and the assets that they are like scaling in that sense to the kind of question you had is like, they are still going to be quite Ethereum based. Um, and I, like, I think that we see that in practice, like that's going to happen with someone like Eclipse of like, they're in Ethereum L2, um, depends on what you call an L2, but they're going to continue to use something like Celestic underneath for DA um, because it's just going to make more sense for them as a business. Um, so that is kind of the differentiation that like I see between them is like, I, I think the all the places that TA, that most of the places that TA gets used will disproportionately have Ethereum DA. Um, uh, sorry, we'll have Celestia DA. Like there'll be relatively Celestia native projects because that's like kind of what it starts as a selling point. Um, I think that increasingly you will see a lot of the places that ETH gets used uses off-chain DA just because there's only so much DA that Ethereum can provide and certainly at least will for at least a couple of years. Um, but there's a lot of demand to use ETH. And so I think that you're going to continue to see these kind of like hybrid solutions that are, we're in Ethereum L2, that's where most, most of our users come from. That's the kind of the ecosystem we're trying to scale, but like we're swapping different DA underneath, whether that's Avo, Lyra, like all these different ones, you're like, you're going to keep saying that. Um, so I, I don't see that trend changing anytime soon, but like Ethereum still just has such a gigantic head start on just the lindiness of the ecosystem, the moneyness of the asset that people still want to use ETH. Um, like that is still what most people want to use as like, while Stia is hoping to become this modular money over time, the practical reality is today is that like, it has a much worse token distribution, less of it's, you know, it's got a higher uh, inflation rate, it's less neutral, like all these different things that Ethereum has by a gigantic leg up over every ecosystem. Um, and that gap's not gonna change overnight. Like people are gonna still want to keep using this. And the center of activity is still going to be Ethereum because of, you know, restaking and all these high value applications that are there. So, yeah. How would you, how are these two ecosystems going to compete on their export being money? It, it's sort of an, an interesting reframe because initially, and honestly, Chris Goes has written a, a phenomenal blog post about this kind of like supply side versus demand side economics when it comes to blockchain. But the mental model used to be all these things were bundled into one place. And if you wanted to go use the things within this protocol and ecosystem, then you had to use the native currency, which was something like ETH. But now what we're talking about in both the case of Celestia with Tia and Ethereum with ETH is there's this protocol, which doesn't actually really do that much. But the thing that's valuable is the lindiness of its export. And so it changes the game in terms of how you're supposed to compete. And I, I would just be curious, like, and I promise we'll bring this back to liquid staking in a second, but how does Tia and ETH, the asset compete? when the functionality of the protocol is much less of a factor? I mean, ultimately what people use as money and what they prefer as money is going to keep changing over time. And there's, I, there's no objective like right answer to that. I think there's a lot of factors that go into it and it will keep changing over time. Um, in practice, especially in the longer run, I, I mean, like I definitely think you see a kind of like power law to this. Of just, like there's not gonna be a thousand different monies that like people want to use, especially because I mean, the barriers will just continue to break down such that it's easier and easier and easier over time that like, hey, if I spin up a new chain, it doesn't actually matter what the protocol architecture underneath is, what I use for DA, where I settle, blah, 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 like all those different things. I just have a chain. And if people want to use X asset, they can use X asset. And so as those barriers become better over time, you're going to see, okay, it doesn't actually matter if my chain is using this DA and that blah, blah, blah. Like if people want to use ETH on my chain, they're going to use ETH on my chain. Um, and that's what you see in practice with someone like Eclipse again of, and all, the, all these other ones that are transitioning to a lot of this Celestia DA is that like their existing user base that they're going after is like, Hey, we prefer ETH. Like, this is what we want to use. It doesn't matter that in the background, there's like some cost that's like variable 
that the chain needs to pay in Tia terms. Like it's not that hard for like, all right, we just handle this on the back end. Like we swap some ETH to Tia and like we pay the gas fees for you on the back end. It's going to keep getting abstracted away more and more. And you're just going to have what what do users prefer to use as an asset? Um, and so that's where a lot of it becomes like Slicey needs to make itself if it's going to be any form of like the modular money, like it needs to just make itself more of an attractive asset um, for people to use within a certain, certain ecosystem. Um, and that's going to be a lot of just like the community around it and then the assets, of the the quality of the asset itself that will like change over time and all of those will get better. Um, but it's the, all it, a lot of it is really going to be like just the decentralization of the asset, the ownership of it, the distribution of it, um, just like having more reasonable economic policy that's going to take time. Like it, like it's not actually money today. I don't think that like anything outside of Bitcoin and ETH is actually like reasonably close to like a form of money today. Like even Sol is not there. I think they can get there in the long run as they get a much better distribution, a much better credit neutrality of the asset. Um, they have, so Celeste has a path to that. Um, and I think people will use it in excitement of that, but like it's definitely not there today. Like it will take a very, very long time um, to fully get there. Yeah, well, one area that I am pretty excited about is seeing what tokens are used on Sovereign rollups built on Celestia. Um, something that I've uh, underestimated in the past is how powerful tribalism is. And I think Sovereign rollups in particular, you know, this concept was born out of Celestia and the first Sovereign rollups I think are going to be built on Celestia, um, probably by people who own a lot of TIA and will use TIA as the base asset. So there's like reasons to use ETH um, as money. You know, it's more decentralized, less volatile, um, very liquid, all these things. Um, but I think all of that can be outweighed by tribalism. And uh, Sovereign Rollups, I think, is probably going to be the first place that we see to you use this money. Uh, yeah. So I have a, I was actually going to go exactly to this. And I'm curious to get your perspective on this, Aiden, and, and yours as well, John. But here's a, here's a pro and a con that I see for the ETH rollup ecosystem versus what has historically been seen in... Um, Cosmos. And I think it comes down to the trade-off between a shelling point and interop. And the vision from Co from Cosmos from the very beginning was this interoperable network of chains. And sovereignty was a huge pull for why you were building in Cosmos as opposed to Ethereum. And the benefit of that is that you have this like kind of ideologically driven neutral public good in the form of IBC, which has solved like interop and bridging. And it not only solved a technical problem, it solved a social problem, which is everyone just built their chain from day one, from the perspective that these were going to be interoperable. Now, the the, the opposite is going on over an ETH rollup land, where maybe eventually there's going to be interoperability between rollups, but maybe never. And, and I don't even think it's a technical reason. It's a social reason. It's like the incentive is for each of these rollups to try to create the dominant ecosystem where all of this stuff lives. Now, the trade-off of each of these things is Cosmos has struggled from the beginning to have one canonical shelling point. And the sovereignty kind of cuts both ways because everyone wanted to use their own native token as gas. They didn't want to use Atom, right? Um, and it, it, there was never a cohesive narrative. And so that was, the, that was the, the flip side of that, where I could actually see over an Ethereum land it's the vibe like everyone used ETH this gas and I could actually see Ethereum getting used as gas. Whereas I think the challenge in the sovereign rollup land is actually going to be every sovereign rollup wanting to use their own token as money. And even if that's not feasible long term, Miles and I have this debate on a weekly basis, it probably will be tried in the beginning. So I'd be I'd be curious to get your your take on that. So I see to summarize, I see Tia's competition not as ETH, but the sovereign rollups that actually use its own ecosystem. Yeah, well, uh, two two things I would say to that. The first is uh, I think there are uh, other reasons. So, uh, like using the native token as gas, that's one reason to build an app chain. But there are other reasons. Um, being sovereign allows you to fork in the case of a hack, for example, um, or a protocol bug. Um, it allows for much easier coordination around um, upgrades, and then there are some other sort of security benefits that you get um, from having an app chain as well. Um, so there, there are other benefits, and I think a lot of them translate to rollups as well. Um, but in Cosmos, it's always been the case that when you launch a protocol, you need a token uh, to secure the validator set. This is no longer true after uh, interchain security, but historically, it's like 98 mm. out of 100 app chains have a token. So there was no other route. With rollups, you don't need a native token, and you still have all the security benefits. Um, and I think this is like sort of played out on ETH. Like ETH is much more money-like than ARV or OP, and... Uh, I think it, it'll 
I think it'll play out similarly on on Celestia, but uh, I guess yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, I I very much agree with that. Um, I I think for a mix of reasons, you won't see most of these sovereign roll ups kind of mimicking what we have seen in Cosmos in the early days. For a mix of what he was just describing there, Aiden, of I think that a lot of it will look like Ethereum, where a lot of these protocols don't want to launch a token, or at the very least, don't want to launch a token. Uh, when they launch, because people want to wonder if there's going to be a token, and there's when? a high, yeah, <laughs> like when be, being realistic, like that was very helpful to people, like optimism and arbitrum that like they didn't have a token at the start, but like people wondered, like when are you gonna have a token? Most protocols will want that, as opposed to just like launching with one right away and they're just like, hey, here are all the tokens. Um, that's generally attractive to most protocols and from most that I've spoken to, they like tend to be going that route of like, we won't launch with one, but like, I like, we can have one later. Um, and there's a meaningful path dependence, um, to how these ecosystems develop. So like, okay, if that's the incentive is to launch in that way without your token at first, but like have one later on, but you know, Hey, we're live for like six months or a year first. And in that entire period, uh, this other asset whether that's Stia or ETH becomes the base money and the base asset in your ecosystem over the past six months or a year, you're not just going to like show up a year later and be like, Hey, here's my governance token. We're going to make it the gas token. Now, like users are just going to like kind of tell you to fuck off if you try to do that for the most part. Um, and it would just be like a really bad business decision. Um, I, I think that more people had a view a couple of years ago of like, Oh, this gives us like a lot of utility. It makes our token worth more. Like if it's used as a gas token, I think that most people realize in practice, like, you're just creating a lot of barriers to user adoption and you're just going to hurt yourself if you try to force in like roll up token number 46 as the gas token of your chain and this user has to figure out how to help like how the hell to get this thing like they're just not going to figure it out they're just not going to use your thing um and so i think in practice what aiden said is right it's going to look a lot like ethereum where these chains are going to build themselves on either eth or tia as probably their like starting asset and there's just gonna be a huge path dependence um mm. and particularly these sovereign rollups they're not the ones who are going to start with ETH. The ones that are Ethereum L2s, like Eclipse, even though they're using Celestia DA, they're going to start with a high path dependence on like ETH is probably going to be the main asset. That's the gas token, even though it will have a lot of Stia DeFi. The ones that start as sovereign rolls without a tie to Ethereum, I think that most of them are incentivized to just start without their own token and just use Tia as like the main token. Because like that's going to minimize the onboarding. That's going to be tapping into the right community that they're trying to go after. Um, like they're generally incentivized to take that path. And I think that path just keeps running itself out. They don't change that, you know, a year later when they have their own token. And I think it's a much mm. better model than all these different chains forcing their own one in them. And fun, fun fact, Tia and Adam are both gas tokens on Stripe. Yeah. Very cool. So, uh, you know, some light bulb actually just went on there hearing you discuss that. So it feels like there's an opportunity for restaking as well. There's a restaking part of this story for sovereign rollups, right? That might want to launch without, I hadn't even thought about that, John, but that's a really good point. Without their own token, suddenly they can do things like points, right? Points, 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 uh, or whatever, and then get that when token, you know, sort of uh, initial burst of activity. Uh, I would be curious, Aiden, have you thought about uh, restaking uh, at all? Because there's a, there's a natural alignment as well in between liquid staking and restaking, I would say. Um, so, I mean, I guess this is something that could potentially... It's just such a funny, could, I guess Eigenlayer could say, you know, I think a lot of people assume that Eigenlayer is going to be ETH restaking forever, but there's probably good evidence to suggest that that's not actually the case. Um, pretty sure Freeom has actually said that on a bell curve in the past. So anyway, we can assume that's not going to be the case, but uh, there could be opportunity, I guess, for a more STIA or TIA aligned uh, restaking provider as well. So I don't know if that's something you thought about. Yeah, the way that I think about... Um about liquid staking, restaking, stride, all this is, uh, to, to some of John's earlier points, stride does one thing and does it very well right now, which is liquid staking. Um, if it does, uh, anything else in the future, um, like restaking or exporting other tokens as a bridge or something like that, um, it should be very aligned with those, with that ethos. Um, restaking is a huge opportunity for sure. Um, it does have, I think different, uh, risks than liquid staking. Um, in particular, managing leverage is, is much more challenging. Um, so on the one hand, you know, maybe there are some vertical integration benefits to liquid staking and restaking, but on the other, there's all these new risks that you introduce. Um, so I don't really know where, where I stand on it um, today, but Stride doesn't currently have any plans to, to build restaking. Um, 
the the other thing I would say is I think that the in terms of the value chain, uh, I think like uh, let, let's just take Ethereum for example. ETH is the base token. That's what everyone wants. Um, like that's uh, the community that people are buying into. It's what defines the ideals. Um, Steeth layers uh, yield on top of ETH, so uh, Steeth depends on ETH. And I think similarly, restaking will depend on on liquid staking. If Steeth is the best um, collateral, for example, and users demand, uh, you know, they already are getting like their five percent yields from Steeth, they're going to want to deposit that into Eigenlayer. Um, unclear what the yields from Eigenlayer will be, but uh, let's say it's like one or two percent. I think if Eigenlayer says like, "Hey, actually, no, we're not going." Also, I'm just uh, I, Eigenlayer has not suggested this. I'm just using these familiar names. Um, if Eigenlayer said that you know we're not going to accept Seath and we're going to build our own LST, I think that would be a big foot gun um, because users are demanding using Seath as collateral. So that's sort of like the the dependency value chain that I see. Um, right. So I, I think restaking and liquid staking will be very um, uh, mutually beneficial. Yeah, I think it's hard to answer like where this will play out. I, I think that I will have the very clear benefit of just like looking at Ethereum and being meaningfully behind that and just seeing how it plays on Ethereum of like who kind of has the power between the liquid staking protocol um, versus the restaking protocol if they're separate um, depends to a large degree on like, like who has the kind of stronger consumer demand of like if literally everyone wants to restake with Eigenlayer and like all of this teeth is deposited into Eigenlayer. Well, then maybe Eigenlayer does think about like, oh, hey, like we actually have the power here. Like, what if we just like swap the center of our own thing? Um, if in practice, the vast majority is still in Steve and like restaking is this like fun thing, but it's not like overwhelmingly a gigantic piece of the market where they could like really just kind of take it over themselves. Um, then in practice, they like can't actually do that. And so a, a lot of it will just depend on like how big is restaking over time. Um, in Ethereum, I mean, most of what we see is I think that restaking as a meta and as a DeFi thing to play around with will be very large this year. Um, I think it is unclear if at this point still, if restaking as a like actually very large economic model that like secures a million AVSs and provides a meaningful amount of yield in the long run for a lot of users. Um, I think that's a huge question. I don't think that like as of right now, the answer is not yes. Um, that's like, like definitely. Um, and so Celestia is just like way behind on that of like, there isn't, you know, uh, a line of people who want $10 billion of, you know, stake, uh, Stia right now to like, re you know, to restake and secure their chain. Like it just doesn't, it just doesn't exist at all right now. Um, but there's a real need for like, people do want to use Stia in a lot of these places early on. Um, so yeah. it'll just be seeing like, how, how do these markets develop over time? Like, what is it that users want? Because yeah, there, there are some benefits of putting them together, but there are also benefits of like keeping them neutral and separate and like keeping them very distinct products. Cause like building either one is like a very full-time job with a gigantic team and they're very different. Um, and that's why we see that in Ethereum and practice so far of like Lido is just like, Hey, for now, like we're just staying in our own lane and Eigenlayer is being also same like, Hey, for now, like we're just going to stay in our own lane and just kind of like see where this goes. Um, I, I think that's like the right strategy for pretty much everyone for now is just like, especially because Celestia would be so far behind on that. Like it's, it's not about to have like this, like gigantic need for restaking tomorrow. Like it just doesn't exist. So. Yeah. Well said. Well, uh, guys, maybe we can start to wind down here. Uh, we've given uh, quite a long podcast for listeners, but I, I want to conclude with, you know, John, you sort of, we've, we've talked through actually some of the, some of the reasons specifically why, but maybe we could end with, you know, why the market for Celestia and the penetration of liquid staking is going to be meaningfully different from the penetration that we've seen in uh, Cosmos or Solana. We've again talked about a lot of those reasons, but let's just underline it so that the so the listener kind of walks away with it. And then Aiden, I mean, uh, and we should have caveated this at the beginning, by the way. But both John and I are investors in uh, Stride, so you know. But uh, we're we're you know for good reason. We've been fans for a long time. So um, yeah, we'd love to just kind of end on why Celestia again that that penetration might be very different, and kind of what are future plans for for Stride that listeners can uh, expect to look out for. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, in summary, the I would say the the kind of main things is like, that's my high level view of like, why Celestia is such an attractive market for someone like Stride um, is, I mean, one is just the raw size of like the underlying asset of just like, yeah, Celestia is like the T is worth a lot and will probably worth more in the future, not financial advice. Um, but um, the other part is like, okay, out of that, like how much is going to be liquid staked? And I do think that like, that's going to be higher over time. Um, and the reason is because I do think it mimics a lot more of the dynamics in Ethereum 
um, much more closely than most of these other existing Cosmos chains or other existing chains, um, it, particularly in that the goal of this asset is to be kind of used as this like money-like thing across many, many different chains. Like the, the version that the end user is always going to be interacting with is going to be this bridged version at the end of the day anyway, and is going to be used widely in that capacity in a way that like a lot of these other Cosmos tokens are, uh, are not of like Neutron accepts a bunch of gas tokens uh, and Stride accepts a bunch of different gas tokens. Uh, uh, most users don't actually pay in them because like they don't actually want to use this thing and they don't care about it. Like most just use whatever. Um, Tia is actually going to be in a strong position where like that will be the preferable thing that like most people use across these both gas, DeFi, all these different things. So you get a lot of broad adoption on all these, all these different chains um, and it will be a bridge representation on all of them. Um, and so like once you're already in that position, you're going to, you're going to hold the liquid staking token like that, that is going to be most users preferences. And we start to see that playing out on Ethereum today of like, there are a lot of ridiculous things around blast, but like the, the core idea and that some others are like leaning into now is like, yeah, if I'm holding ETH on a roll up, I should just be holding the liquid staking token. Like, like why wouldn't I? Um, and so I think that trend is going to very much play out in Celestia in a way that we just don't see. Um, and these other Cosmos chains of this one asset, like proliferating as money across these many different chains. Like once you're in that scenario, you're going to want the liquid staking token and you're going to want the one that's the most neutral, the safest, the most reliable, the closest to the base layer. Um, and that's what led us to strive because like they were clearly the best team who were doing this. We were very impressed. So. Yeah. Thank you, John. And um, in terms of our plans, um, as John said, you know, uh, neutral, aligned, all those things. Uh, by the time this goes live, we'll have launched um, with SCT. Um, it's secured by a multi-sig on the back end comprised of a number of uh, validators. Um, this is the only way for us to launch now. Um, we'll be migrating to interchain accounts in a few months. And then ZK rollup approach is probably 12 plus months out. Um, it's sort of our technical migration path. In terms of what's next on the, uh, like, uh, what, what's next in the wild? Like where is SCT gonna be used? What's actually gonna happen? Um, three main things I would highlight. The first is airdrops. Uh, I think the reality is today, uh, you know, there's an explosion of activity around Celestia for good reason. And lots of those teams are airdropping to uh, TIA stakers. Uh, I think it's going to be really important that STTIA stakers and any other LSP that they're included in those airdrops. Um, practically, this just happens with um, like work behind the scenes, talking to these teams, indexing STTIA holders, things like that. That's going to be really critical. Um, the second is organic activity. Um, so Stride typically incentivizes liquidity and sometimes organic activity. So that'll happen around the ecosystem. You know, we're talking to teams like Eclipse, Astria, um, Dimension, Manta, Longlist. Um, so bootstrapping that. Um, and then the third is uh, we're starting to think about how to bridge SCT to rollups. Um, and uh, more news on that will be, will be coming soon. So that's kind of what you can expect um, for SCT in the next uh, few weeks. Awesome guys. Well, look, this was a, this was a phenomenal conversation from my perspective. We went for almost two hours and I think we only covered about 50% of the detail that was in John's original post. So again, guys, we're going to link that in the show notes. Definitely go and check that out, especially if you want to nerd out a little bit more around some of the technical details that we sort of skipped over, but yeah, Aiden could not be more pumped for, uh, for stride and the future of Stia as modular money. Um, so and, and guys, Aiden uh, or John, if, if folks want to find out more about the work that you guys are doing or follow you or, or whatever, what's the best way to do that? I'm uh, uh, Aiden Xerox on Twitter. Best place to find me. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or uh, just dba.xyz is our website. Easiest Sweet. to find everything there. Awesome, guys. Well, this was a really fun one. Appreciate both of you. And uh, yeah, we'll do something like this again soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Take care. Yep. Yeah.